This week's episode of the Salt and Sauce Chat Show is sponsored by North Broad Street Records, bringing you the very best in unissued music. North Broad Street Records discovers and brings to vinyl cool, unfinished gems. For more information, please visit www.northbroadst.co.uk. Coming up on this week's Salt and Sauce Chat Show. Uh, our first game, ironically, was in the San Siro. Uh, Milan against Anderlecht. <laughs> And the president obviously remembered me because he refused to shake my hand. And the next one around the corner is uh, Gareth Bale. So Bale says to me, he says, ah, I see you've uh, see you brought the Scottish weather with you. Now, when you come out of the dressing room, there's steps all the way down. You've got the metal mesh between the two. Pepe's two steps down, but he stops, comes back up and says to, to Gareth Bale, he went, no, Bale, he says, since you start, you bring sheep shagging weather. <laughs> <laughs> you're standing there going, wait a minute, this is Real Madrid, this is, you know, we're waiting to go to a Champions League game. Yeah. I would say 99.9 of them wouldn't be able to tell you how many laws of the game there are. In fact, let's test it. <laughs> Do you know how many laws of the game there are? No, couldn't tell you. Couldn't, I'd be making it up, I'd be guessing. Yeah. Welcome along to another episode of the Salt and Sauce Chat Show. I'm David Simmons, and on this week's show, I'm delighted to be joined by a gentleman who's going to give us an alternate view on the world of football. We've got referee and official from the SFA, Willie Conker, on the show. Willie, thanks for coming in, mate. No problem, David. Thanks for having me. No, you're welcome. I mean, I've been involved in football myself since I think I was eight years old, and if you look at the, the job a referee does, if you like, it's one I would never, ever do. What made you throw yourself into the fire pit and become a referee? Well, funny enough, I wasn't that good at football either, David. Um, <laughs> as most most of the guys will probably tell you that um, you know we we're, we're, in re- we're into refereeing because we're all football fans. Um, I was an average player as an amateur, um, played under under fourteens, fifteens, sixteens, up to nineteens, and then started work. Um, but no, we got got into it because of um, because of the love of football. Yep, I mean you've officiated at like the highest of levels. What what sort of training do you do to get to the top? Um, well, I mean, it, it, once you you pass your badge, you go through an entrance exam. Um, I done a thirteen week course in Edinburgh, um, where the three um, coaches take you through every law, um, and then at the end of that, you get a mock exam in week twelve, and then the actual exam in week thirteen. Thankfully, with modern technology, I don't think that. It's a 13-week course anymore because it's all done on um, computers and things. Um, but after you sit your exam and you pass it, it's then you get affiliated to... Well, back when I passed my badge 23 years ago, <laughs> um, which, you know, was a long time ago, um, you got affiliated to, to a youth league. Um, so I was obviously a, a member of the Edinburgh and District uh, Referees Association at the time. Um, so I was a, got games in the, the under-12s to under-15s. Um, and then from there, you progress through 16s, 18s, as it was, 19s, 21s. If you were lucky, you would go then down the route of junior football. Mm. Um, and once you get to the junior football, you could then go forward towards the, what we call the senior list. Right. So when you get to the senior list, you've got um, basically category three, category two, category one, category one being you're a category one referee. Category two, you would generally nowadays just referee. Um, Very rarely would you be an assistant referee and run the line. Um, Category three is the same. And then once you're category three, you've got to then make a sort of path. You've got a path to choose Mm -hmm. um, whether you want to go down the referee route or you want to go down the assistant referee route. And you made the decision to go down the the sort of linesman route, didn't you? Is that right? Yeah, I mean, again, I I was a category three um, I'd done. I'd progressed quite quickly um, through the through the the under twenty ones, through the amateur senior amateurs in Fife because um, I'd moved over to Dunfermline by then. Right. Emigrated over the water, <laughs> um, and at that time I was twenty eight, twenty nine. So I wasn't a, you know I wasn't a really a a spring chicken as it, as some of the guys now. You know some of the guys are taking it up at well sixteen is the minimum age now. Um, so my, when, the, when I got to category three, I was looking at, right, okay, you know, if I got to category one, would I then be able to progress to the Premier League? 
because that is the top league in Scotland. Um, and at the time, if I recall correctly, when I was asked if um, you know what route I wanted to go, and I chose the assistant referee route. I didn't think I'd get to the level I got to, but, you know, it, it was a case of... I was thinking if I got to Category 1, would they give me a Premier League game at 42, 43? And I thought, I'll take my chance and, and go down the assistant route because, obviously, they'd got a, a, a band of referees, or assistant referees, sorry, and they've got a category that they um, developed and created called um, Specialist Assistant Referees, mm -hmm. or SERs, as we call them. Right. So... That was the route I wanted to, to go down. Ah, right, I see. I mean, it's not a full-time job in Scotland, is it? I mean, um, and there's a stereotype where you've got to be maybe a, a lawyer, a solicitor, even an SNP leader, if you like. You're just a, a guy for Bingham, aren't you? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Proudy, proudy, proudy being a wee boy for Bingham. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I've heard this all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate. When I was at Portobello High, went to Lismore Primary, went to Portobello High, um, sat the exams, couldn't tell you, you know, I got the grades that probably any guy at my age at that time, you would, you know, your old grades and whatever. Um, I went to work for um, a couple of charities um, that are no longer with us anymore, and it was called Work Experience. Mm. So we went down to an old, a couple of old folks' homes in Leith, and then I got two weeks to work in John Lewis. Um, and after the two weeks in John Lewis, they invited me to stay for another month. Um, and then from that, they asked me if I'd want to um, start a YTS, so I started in John Lewis in August 86 as a YTS in the, in the toy department, went to flooring, went to electrical, then got kept on, because at that time you couldn't be kept on until you had done 18 months. Um, so I went then back to flooring after 18 months, um, and I stayed in flooring all my days. So I was on the shop floor, I worked in the warehouse in John Lewis, I became a, a flooring estimator, going out to measure and right. estimate people's houses, um, and then from there, I, I left there to work as a, a buyer with Volcom Furnishers, who are unfortunately no longer with us. Right. Um, went back to John Lewis when they got bought over from the Sterling Group. Um, then started on the road as a, a representative or a, or a sales rep, as it's known, a carpet rep. Um, and I've been on the road ever since. I'm currently working for a company called Orchard Timber Products. Oh, okay. um, but I'm commercial manager for Scotland for Orchard Flooring Products. Um, so we've got a branch in Forfar, which is our head office, a branch in um, Livingston, and we've got a lad who does contracts in Aberdeen. Right. So the myth of being a lawyer, uh, you know, it's it's nonsense. It's it, you've got to be good at what you do, um, and you've got to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Um, no, it's a good sort of uh, story you gave there because it's it's good for any aspiring referee that's maybe coming through and thinking, oh wait a minute, I'm not an SNP leader, I'm not a social. Uh, uh, a solicitor, sorry, or a lawyer. Yeah. If if whatever background you come from, you can still get to the top. Yeah, absolutely. It's about um, how you conduct yourself. You know how how you, you your mannerisms are, because at the end of the day, you're starting off at the bottom end of kids' football, and it's mm -hmm. no easy because the parents are, you know, the parents are are worse than <laughs> walking out in front of fifty, sixty thousand in an old fun game. Yeah. Um. You know, and it, it, and you've got to, you've got to be able to to do the job and do it well. Yeah. Um, whether you're educated or not, I don't believe for a minute that. In fact, I know that there's nobody sits at, at Hamden and says, "Oh, he can't make it because he's this or that or whatever." It's a complete myth. Now, I want to talk to you quite a bit about VAR. What are your views on VAR? We've obviously seen this being implemented uh, down in England. I think it's a case that we maybe not got the money up here in Scotland to roll it out. But what, what's your views on that as a referee? Um, it's quite funny because I changed my my views on it um, because when we were when we were advised it was coming in obviously we were using the, the, the additional assistant referees or like we've seen in the cup final on Sunday or the semi-finals pri uh, prior to that VAR was introduced to try and help the refereeing team and try and prevent the major mistakes um, and fortunately our, our friends from over the border um, seem to be the complete opposite because if you look at some of the offsides, I mean, the worst one's uh, the Leeds one, where the, the Bamford's actually it's, pointing yeah. to tell his colleague, I can't remember who played it, was it I had, like To play a through ball, wasn't to it? To play the through ball. Yeah. And because of his armpit, you know, and it's all these lines, I mean, you're talking about, I can even I can even say the words that they used to, you know, whatever that 
algorithms and yeah, trigonometry yeah, sets yeah, that yeah, they need. I'm like, yeah. you know, that, that's not what it was introduced for. Yeah. Um, and up till this season, again, England were the only country in the world where the referees were advised to go and look at the screen where they would actually go and do it. Every other country done it other than England. Mm. So guys kept asking me, why is that? Well, you've got to ask the English FA why they didn't, or the, the English referees, why they didn't do it. Because that's that's the whole point of it. Is, And again, in the laws of the game, it's in the opinion of the referee. So if you've got somebody telling you to go and have a look at the screen and you go over and have a look at it, then you're looking at the screen and it's still your opinion. But if you've been told that's not a red card or that's not a penalty, that's somebody else's opinion. So, for example, you could have the likes of Willie Collum in the middle and Willie Conker in the booth and I, I say to Willie, that's not a penalty. And you're saying to yourself, well, his experience is, you know, massively compared to mine's. Or a better example would probably be one of the younger referees who's breaking into the, say, the, the championship because that's who would be sitting in the in the VAR room. Right. And that's what happens in England. That they've, they've now addressed that, I believe, where the guys in the VAR room are actual premiership referees right. and no guys from a, a lesser who are still building up to that. Right. It was brought in to benefit the refereeing teams. Unfortunately, we've not seen that at the moment. No, I mean, would you welcome it to Scotland if it did get the green light? Yeah, anything to help the guys. You know, anything. Because, I mean, I, I've been on the end of, you know, a few decisions over my career where looking back, you think, how did you miss that? Or how did you get that wrong? Um, but it happens because it's a fast game and it's getting faster. So running a line like what you did, like offside, for example, you get that split second to make that decision are you, are you trained for that obviously do you get in depth training from the SFA to, to make that choice yeah the, I mean it's obviously developed more and more over the over the years um, I mean a lot of the time when you're you're brought all together you have maybe half a dozen um, sessions each season where we bring the guys together um, and they break up the referees will go and do something for an hour or so the assistants will go and do something for an hour or so and then they all come together and do it but there's more and more um, in the last probably even since I retired three seasons ago there's more and more training we've now got coaches which I'm privileged to be one of them I'm looking after three guys um, and I've been doing that since I, since I retired from active refereeing um, and the training that the guys are given is, and again it's all about looking at clips you know and it's not only you no know, clips for the Champions League or the Premier League at our training, there's, there's clips from junior games because a lot of the clubs are now filming their, their games. So we're, we're rolling that out more and trying to get the younger referees who are coming up and explaining to them, you know, why why you got the decision wrong or how did you get that decision right? So there's a lot of, a lot of training um, on that side of it given. Yeah. Um, and the, the, it's difficult just now because of the COVID. Um, but in the Fife Referees Association, we used to give up one Monday, a, one sorry, Tuesday a month um, so train every Tuesday night. We'd give up one one Tuesday a, a month where they would allow us to go and do training. So we'd ask the younger guys who are just coming into it to bring a flag with them. Because even holding a flag, yeah, it's you know the, a lot of the guys you'll see in the lower leagues their their techniques of holding the flag. Or if you go and watch a junior game, their techniques of holding the flag. And then you look at the guys in the Premier League and you'd be like, wow, what a difference! Now a lot of my mates and even my colleagues that I work with who are all football fans. Um, never really paid much attention to that, but obviously on a Monday morning, if I'm in the office or if I'm in the Livingston branch, and oh, did you see that or did you see? But now the guys are actually saying, oh yeah, I can understand why you got that right or yeah. wrong. So it's there's a lot of just little things like that that we don't even notice as supporters. Yeah, I mean Fiona used to my wife Fiona, who was who's obviously been a great support right through my career. Um, she used to walk into the bedroom and I'd be standing in front of the mirror with the, with the flag and the <laughs> pose and, you know, boy, you know, just because, especially when you get to the, you know, the Premier League, you're going to be on the telly. Yeah. Um, and what you didn't want to be doing is, you know, not being able to signal correctly or whatever because it stands out like a, like a sore thumb. So on a match day, Willie, talk us through what we don't see as, as supporters watching the game. Obviously, communication via headsets and microphones and yeah. I believe your flags have even got beepers as well. Yeah, there was a flag, what, yeah. Talk us through that. What, what, do, what don't we see? Well, what you first of all don't see, David, is the time that most of the guys leave to get to their games. Yeah. I mean, if you out with COVID, because obviously the COVID's completely different now, yeah. but prior to, if, let's take my my last game at Tynecastle was, was Hearts versus Celtic, live on Sky. 
Um, it was a 12.30 kick-off. So Hearts used the Dalmahoy Hotel. In fact, you might want to edit that. because that's. <laughs> what, um, but the, we, we meet up at a hotel. We leave our cars. The club send a bus or a, a, a car to pick you up. Um, so we, we would say we would be in the hotel at half past nine, quarter to ten in the morning. we get picked up the car. We would then go to the stadium. We'd be at the stadium at 11 o'clock. So we'd be at the stadium an hour and a half before kick-off. Dump the, dump the bags in the dressing room, walk the pitch, make sure the markings are fine. On that particular day, funny enough, that was the day that Brendan Rodgers complained about the length of the grass. Right. Um, but obviously the pitch was getting dug up the following day, so they weren't going to cut the grass. Yeah. Uh, which there was a couple of stories to that, which was quite <laughs> funny. So after you, 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 you then go back to the dressing room, and obviously the grounds are coffee, tea, TV on the wall, but the music's playing in the background. Um, most of the referees do their bit of chat in the hotel, but when you get to that level of the Premier League, there's not a lot of pre-match instructions, really. It's just chats about games and, um, you know, maybe there, were, there had been a mistake in a game the previous week. Um, the referee will ask you to, to think about how that mistake could have been rectified, blah, 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 blah. And then but 20, half, 35, 40 minutes before kickoff, you'll go out and do a warm-up, come back in, get all the communication equipment all, all linked up, because now we're all obviously mic'd up. Um and then 15 minutes before you're back in the dressing room after the war, the, the warm up to do all of that. Then five minutes in the tunnel, game finishes, shower change, back to the hotel, and then you're away back up the road. So your day, my day for that particular day, my day started at nine. I left the house at nine o'clock, and got back at probably about half past three, quarter to four. So it's a decent, you know, it's a decent length of time. Yep. Whereas most guys think you turn up if it's a three o'clock kickoff at five to three and away we go. So uh, all through the game, are you always in, in communication with the referee? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, obviously the and again, this is something that you maybe see some of the referees laughing and what are you thinking? What's he laughing at? Because the banter is is um, is incredible. Because we we're a team. Yeah. It's like the two teams that are on the park playing against each other. We're a team as well, um, and that's why I, you know sometimes you fall out with with people because they don't think you are a team well, we are a team you know And so are you actually put in like a, a, a group together and is that the group that you'll go around or is it alter sometimes no it or? alters every week yeah. um, when I I was fortunate enough that um, during my European career when uh, when Willie Collum got promoted to elite within UEFA um, and FIFA uh, he got to, cho- uh, to choose his assistants mm. um, and I was fortunate to be one of them um, other games that normally UEFA it's changed a lot because UEFA now put the guys together yeah. but generally they're in Europe they're in the same team domestically you could be you could be with any of the guys because at the end of the day they're they're all the top you know, top referees top assistants um, and then occasionally you'll get the newer guys coming through um, who'll do a, a maybe a, a lower key game right. it's no live on the telly and you still get on sports scene obviously so the guys are still really nervous because I've been on a few games where it's the guy's first game on in the Premier League uh, and I remember my first game in the Premier League at Petaudry with Callum Murray um, and I was a wreck you know, Aberdeen Inverness it wasn't a live game but you're a wreck because it's a top league and if you m- make a mistake you know what's coming on the, on the <laughs> Sunday <laughs> or the Monday <laughs> um, You touched on your time at Tynecastle there in your last game um, I, I googled you obviously had to be looking at some of <laughs> things and one of the headlines that come up was uh, Hearts last night said sorry to linesman Wally Conker after he was pelted with missiles on a day of turmoil at Tynecastle do you recall those events? Like it was yesterday David yeah <laughs> and I actually had a pop at um, Kyle Lafferty when he before I retired uh, when he was at Hearts because um, it was him that caused it was it? <laughs> yeah because Hearts Hearts, had, Hearts were winning 1-0 and and um, Rangers had equalised, and I don't know if you remember, but Ian Black had a naughty challenge on Jelovic, yes. and he ended up breaking his leg, uh-huh. which, to be fair, at live time, it looks nothing. Um, so, of course, 90 plus two minutes, I think it was, um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it was Naismith that scored the winning goal. So, we're always advised, especially at Tynecastle, where the fans are so close to you, yeah. to prevent the players from going to the crowd. So, I do that. However... I'm sure it was Naismith, and he looked up the tunnel, he looked up the sideline, sorry, and sees McCoyst and Walter Smith celebrating. So he decides to run for the bottom corner past, you know, the north enclosure and the old lady, yeah. as as it was then. And, of course, Lafferty's dragged him to the ground. A lot of the players have jumped on top of him. 
I'm trying to usher them, and of course, big weird shouts to me, Conk, watch your back. And there was missiles, there was cups of whatever, I don't know what was in it. Um, and I actually got a hit on the funny bone <laughs> with a coin. Shouldn't you laugh? <laughs> I know it's not a funny one, you know. Yeah. It was it was sore, but um, I it was it was it was one of these days where I was lucky that the missiles didn't hit my head because yeah. if it hits your head or if it hits a player in the eye, you know it's it's um, it's already laughing about it now. But yeah. yeah, it was it was horrible. And even after the aftermath, um, you know, the police having to come in and take statements and the stewards who were also there. You know, picking up the missiles and bringing them in. Mm. And what sort of paperwork do you guys have to do after events like that in the game? There's a match report that you would have to do on that, which yeah. is separate from the players' behaviour and things like that, because yeah. that's another, you know... Ah, that's what I was going to touch on, the amount yeah, of paperwork you guys do as well, it's, it's unseen by... It's not, I mean, if we if we strip it back to juvenile, amateur, junior, even back, back in my day, yeah, you had to write a report, and you still do at certain levels, but in the Premier League, it's a tick box job. Right. So a yellow card, what for, and then whatever the offence is, because there's loads of offences. Yeah. Um, that particular day, I obviously had to write to say, you know, what had happened, but I didn't know what had happened because it was all coming from behind me. But the, the, the reason and you know why the missiles had come on, etc. Yeah. Um, and then obviously that got forwarded to the to the SP the SPL it would have been at right. the time, uh, and then they do an investigation. And I, I believe, although it wasn't made public, I think one boy got banned for life. Um, really, so Castle. to be honest, you shouldn't it be. Yeah, subject absolutely. to that. Yeah. Um, you, uh, are you aware of the, the atmosphere in Tynecastle? Because it is well known, obviously, with the Rangers and Celtic, that that is a, a bit of a, a bolt to go to, isn't it? It's so close yeah. to the park and the fans are right on top of you, like you say. Are you aware of that as an official? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's one of the best places to to, to officiate. I mean, Tynecastle under the lights, especially when you're playing, you know, Hibs or any of the old firm, those games are, you, you, there's a proper, proper atmosphere. Um, and you must get an adrenaline rush for being involved in that. It was, yeah, yeah. There's, there's probably about the only thing I miss about no. Now I'm retired. Yeah, but, yeah. Oh, it was great. I mean, you, you were nervous. There's no doubt about it. But um, they were the games you wanted to. That's why you do all the training and go through all the, all the things you go through to get to those, those games. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they were. And again, Tynecastle was special because they are so close to you. I mean, Celtic Park, sixty-two thousand. Ibrox, fifty-two and a half. Easter Road now, Easter Road's fantastic, 22,500 the minutes full. Mm -hmm. It still rocks, but they're not as close to you as they are at Tynecastle. Let's talk about some other games you've been involved in. Um, there's a famous story about uh, how you possibly cost Anderlecht 10 million euros. <laughs> <laughs> Google's a horrible thing, it isn't is it? <laughs> it can be when you're on shows like this. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, it was, uh, again, you know, it was uh, after we had done the. Uh, it, it, I got when you domestically when you get to SCR you can then go to become a FIFA assistant referee. Where Scotland, are, I've got ten, um, seven referees and ten um, assistant referees. So I was in a privileged position that I was one of those ten. And um, you get the phone call for Drew Herbertson, who is no longer with us. He retired a couple of couple of seasons ago, and you never knew where you were going because the phone call would be like. Um, can you accept an appointment and dust your passport down? And so you you think brilliant. So of course then you get the the, the call where you're going. So it was uh, Anderlecht against Partizan Belgrade. Um, second leg, first leg had finished two two. Second leg at the particular time was uh, two two, and Anderlecht scored until Conk decided that it was offside. Um, unfortunately for me, not the not the first or the second, not even the third or the fourth, not even the fifth camera angle, but the sixth camera angle showed that the guy was marginally onside. So the game then goes to extra time because it finished 2-2. Back then, Sky had the contract. So all the other games in Europe had finished. And because our game went to extra time, Sky showed this all over the UK. And I don't, I don't know if you remember it, but... What sticks in my mind about it more than being told after the game that I'd made a mistake was that the penalty spot disintegrated after the first penalty, similar to what happened to Beckham. Yes. And Partizan won the game. And of course, we're in the dressing room, modern technology, a couple of text messages. It was all quiet. And we had obviously got word around that it was a really, really tight decision. And it wasn't until we were in the minibus because there was trouble outside um, between the Anderlecht fans and the Partizan fans. Uh, that Ian Brines, who was a fourth official that night, 
um, was sitting alongside me in the minibus and he actually put his hand on my thigh and squeezed it and says, be all right, big man, you'll be all right. That's it. I mean, what sort of support do you get from like the SFA or other referees if, if mistakes like this happen? Or? Guys are brilliant. Honestly, the boys are brilliant. I mean, unfortunately, after that game, um, I got the inevitable phone call to tell me, that, you know, we'd be seen it that night because what happens after the game, you go back to the hotel and you get a debrief. Right. So it used to be that you put the DVD in the computer, but now it's a, you know, in fact, you've got the clip on your phone nine times out of ten. Yeah. But you go back for the debrief, and obviously, I was I, the observer was very sympathetic because it was the sixth angle. But because of the, the because of the game, obviously, Anderlecht cost it cost Anderlecht ten million euros. Mm. Now that was a few years ago. So, and the euro wasn't very strong against the pound. So. <laughs> Hopefully, all's <was> forgiven. <laughs> well, funny enough, when I when I went on to to be in Willie's team. Uh, our first game, ironically, was in the San Siro, right. uh, Milan against Anderlecht. <laughs> and the president obviously remembered me because he refused to shake my hand. Oh, really? Yeah. So, but again, it's it's one of these things. We look back on it. If it was a glaring mistake, then you think to yourself, how did you get that wrong? But I still, to this day, don't know how I got that wrong because it was such a, you know, such a tight decision. Like Sidelli, you get a split second to make a decision. You take you? a photograph. No, that's how we're, we're trained. You take a photograph of that particular incident at that time and then you take from that, you know, and you pick it out. But offside is one of the, that is the hardest, I would I would say. Ah, absolutely. So how are the European trips? Do you enjoy that? as like Because obviously, like you say, you get close to the other referees, you've got a group of mates going away. Um, how is that? Do you enjoy the European days? Yeah, or did you enjoy no, it's European? good. It's good fun. I mean, the guys are obviously the the banter's incredible. And that 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 time when I was in Anderlecht, there was only four. Right. Um, and then obviously they, they introduced the the additional assistant referees behind the goals. So um, when we started going away with Willie, um, there were six of us. So there was um, Martin Crines, myself, fourth official at that time. I think mainly was um, Alan Mulvaney. Although they did sw- switch the fourth official around a, a bit. And then Bobby Madden was additional assistant one and John Beaton was additional assistant two. So the, the five out of the six were together all the time when we went abroad. So the, we became good good buddies and obviously the banter, we, 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 especially with Beaton and, and Madden, they're uh, a couple of nutcases, but <laughs> in a good way. Good. Um, uh, well, I've had a look, I've got a list here of all the games you've officiated. <laughs> the one that really stands out is uh, Real Madrid Galatasaray in the Champions League. That must have been some atmosphere at the Bernabeu, was it? It was great, yeah. Yeah. Um, couple of claims to fame in that right enough but again the, a lot of people don't realise you know guys will say to me oh, how do you lead out Hibs or how do you lead out St Johnston or how do you lead out Celtic or how do you lead out Rangers you lead out the team depending on what line you're on so we always say the the stand side is obviously the dugout side or AR1 as we call it right. assistant referee one so in the Madrid game I was assistant referee two so I was on the far side however the way you walk out I happen to be having to get the Madrid team out and a lot of people don't know this but um, we have to double check the numbers to the team sheet because the season prior to us going to Madrid the boy Hulk that played with St Petersburg Brazilian lad he had signed seemingly in the the January window and he was registered to play in the league wearing 9 99 wasn't it correct 99 so he wore the wrong top so obviously that refereeing team got absolutely murdered by UEFA um, so after that, we were all told to go and check, double check the, the numbers and the teams. So that particular night, John Beaton and I went to get the Madrid team out and uh, knocked the door. And abroad, David, it's embarrassing for us in the UK because the li- uh, the English spoken language in these foreign countries is second to none, <laughs> whereas my Spanish is nay, nothing. So anyway, I knocked the door and the wee Spanish kept man, ah, referee, referee, I get them. So he shouts in Spanish. The first guy around the corner is Pepe. So I'm standing there, just check your equipment. Out. And he, the typical, you know, Europeans, shake your hand, kiss each cheek, <laughs> checked his equipment. But the next one around the corner is uh, Gareth Bale. So Bale says to me, he says, ah, I see you've, uh, see you've brought the Scottish weather with you. Now, when you come out of the dressing room, there's steps all the way down. You've got the metal mesh between the two. Pepe's two steps down, but he stops, comes back up, and says to, to Gareth Bailey, he went, no, Bailey, he says, since you start, you bring sheep shagging weather. <laughs> <laughs> you're standing there going, wait a minute, this is Real Madrid, this is, you know, we're away to go to a Champions League game. Yeah. So again, all the players come out, but we're one shot. So Angelotti was a manager. So I said to the kit man, please, we're one shot, please. We're looking at time, because in my ear, 
Willie Collum's screaming conk, we're running out of time, we need to get them out because it's all, you know, timed. Exactly. And they get fined, heavily fined. So Angelotti, next one round the corner was Angelotti. So I've said to Angelotti, please, sir, you know, get Zidane. Why, well, okay. So he shook her hand, have a good game, where he goes. Next one round the corner is Zinedine Zidane. And he's suited and booted, shakes my hand, and he screams, and Ramos comes running. Because I said, I'm saying to Zidane, what's he doing? Is he doing his hair? Is he, he's, no, he's doing his makeup for the camera. I okay. So he comes round, of course, he's, I don't know if you watch pre-match with Madrid, but um, Ramos goes down and kisses every player on the way down. So because I get down to the bottom of the stairs, Colum's still screaming in my ear because we're getting close to walking out. And as I get down to join them, because we've obviously got the two tunnels, Bale and Pepe are still <laughs> having a having a banter about this weather. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so of course the game starts 17 minutes in. I had to get Bully to put Ramos off for denying a clear goal scoring opportunity. It was his, I think it was his 18th red card, which I think he's now up to about 26. Dear um, so but it was a great, a great, you know, 80, 83,000, I think, in the Bernabeu that night. Um, Do you have any favourite stadiums you've officiated at? <sighs> to be fair, because I'm a Bingham boy, as you touched on earlier on, um, Tincastle. For me, the Edinburgh Derby, Hearts Rangers, Hearts Celtic, Hearts Aberdeen, they're all, you know, they were, they were, they, they're all really good stadiums. Yeah, another good night um, or good afternoon, which I've never, never experienced as an assistant referee or as a, a, a spectator um, at Easter Road was in the playoff second leg. Um, the Is that Hamilton against Hamilton? Against really? Hamilton when they got relegated. Yeah. Um, I mean, a, a funny story I could tell you about that, but um, you probably need to cut it because um, Yogi, eh, no Yogi, sorry, Big Butcher was the manager then, but um, for 89 minutes to 90 plus one until Hamilton equalised, three and a, three and three quarter side of the stadium were bouncing. I mean, they were singing Sunshine on Leith, as they do, and then when Hamilton scored, you could have heard a pin drop because the 650 Hamilton fans obviously went mental, yep. but you could have heard a pin drop. And of course, we all know what what happens. Yep. Um, but I don't know if I can tell the story. You can maybe edit it. On you go, mate. On you go. <laughs> so the very last the very last minute of extra time, Willie gives a foul. And uh, the left back, who was on loan for Man City, I uh, can't remember his name. It'll come to me. So he puts the ball down just inside the Hamilton half. And that's it. Ryan, Ryan... Said Ryan, go and take the ball back over the, the line. So he rolls the ball over the halfway line. And again, coming back to the laws of the game, the lines have got to be four inches or ten centimetres. So Terry Butcher standing on my shoulder. Obviously it's live on sky. And Terry Butcher says to me, Conk, is that you complaining about six inches? And I just turned around and said to him, I says, Terry, my wife Fiona complains about six inches every Friday night. <laughs> and the two of us start laughing. Of course, no realising that the cameras are on us. Free kick, for, free kick goes over, Willie blows for full time, Hibs get relegated on penalties. I go back to the dressing room and the first message I pick up is from one of my, my mates I grew up with in Bingham, uh, Willie McKenzie, who was a referee as well. He's not anymore, but still in touch with Willie. And it was like, you hearts. <laughs> <laughs> and I had about 300 and odd messages to the same because obviously all the seniors, me and Terry Butcher, laughing right. at the end of extra time. Oh dear. And again, it's, you know, it was quite... Quite a day. Aye, I can imagine. Oh, dearie me. Um, let's talk about another game on a more serious note. You were an official at Fur Park, uh, Millerbell against Dundee United, when the Phil O'Donnell incident happened. That must have been a horrible experience to be involved in. Yeah, yeah, it was really, really, um, a really sad night. Um, I'd lost Fiona's younger brother um, about six or seven years previous to that. Right. Um, and Doogie was only 27. Um, so that day... Yeah, it was late on in the game. Um, Mother, Motherwell were just about to make a substitution. And I'm just about to, to do the signal um, for the substitution. And some, we didn't know who it was at the time, but somebody obviously fell to the ground. And I'm screaming at the first aid to, to run on and whatever. And we realised it was it was Phil. Um, I'm sure it was John Rankin and Big Lee Wilkie um, tried to put him into the recovery position. Um he was obviously taken away to hospital. Um, we didn't get any news. We got showered and changed. As you can imagine, the dressing room was flat. 
Um, the observer come in, chatted away. We were basically just asking him if there's any update on the information, if he, who he was, because I knew it was serious. We mm -hmm. definitely knew it was serious. Um, so I was driving back over to Dunfermline. I'd phoned Fiona um, just to tell her I was on my way home, and she knew something had happened because she had heard it on the TV. Um, so I said to her, we're still waiting to find news out. So I come off the phone, and Radio Scotland was on, um, Off the Ball was on, and Tam had broke the news that, um, unfortunately, Phil had passed away. Um, so driving over the fourth road bridge, you know, your you're, you're mind's everywhere. Um, so the, I thought, I'll phone Crawford, Crawford Allen, who is now the head of referee operations, was the referee that day. Right. Um, so I phoned Crawford, um, Crawford had just got home, and uh, I said to Crawford, look, just to let you know, Phil's passed away. Um, he says, right, okay. He says, um, right, he says uh, thanks for your help today. It was, you know, it was a difficult end to a game. So I got home, dumped my bag, um, Fiona had made me something to eat, and all I really done, David, was sit in the conservatory uh, with a loop on Sky Sports News um, with all the tributes and, you know, people talking about Phil. And I said to Fiona, I don't want to speak to anybody. Um, a couple of bottles of red wine were sitting beside me and um, and to be fair I only got I only didn't only get I only, res I only accepted two phone calls that night um, one was for Big John Robotham who took me under his wing when I transferred associations over to Fife um, John spoke to me for 10, 15, 20 minutes make sure I was alright hmm. um, which was great and then about half an hour later um, Eddie Smith phoned me now, Eddie was a category 1 referee that I'd done many games with and Phil was his brother-in-law Oh, okay. So obviously I said to Eddie, I'm really sorry, you know, but I need Eddie says no, I appreciate, you know, um, just wanted to, to make sure you were okay, you know, because it must have been difficult for you guys and with Eddie being a referee, you know, he understood the that side of it. Mm. Um and it's one of these games where it's like any tragedy in football or any tragedy anywhere, nobody deserves to go out to uh, to play a game of football and not come home at night. Yeah. Um, but it was very difficult. But yeah, the following the following day, the phone calls that I got, you know, there was loads of loads of the guys were were on the phone, um, just making sure everything was okay. And they offer it if you needed to speak to anybody, then you know there's people there to that they can they can direct you to. Mm -hmm. But it was a very very sad day because um, mm -hmm. Phil was a. I mean that funny enough that day, Crawford was late. Because there was a car crash on the on the motorway, right. so we were we were all panicking if we were going to get to the stadium or to the hotel in time. But we did get there. But funny enough, during the warm up, we we do a but we do a warm up together. Then the assistants break away to run the line and check the line, and you do your own little routine. Um, and the ball had run across to me. And of course, I never looked up. I just played the ball back and and with my left foot. And Phil went, "Oh, did you kick with the left foot then, Conk?" Of course, I just started laughing. I was like, if you only knew me, man. You know? <laughs> and I had a bit of banter because that was the type of guy he was, you know. He, yeah. was, he was a... Absolute tragedy, man. Uh, he was a lovely guy and it was a tragedy and, you know, it's a very, very sad day for football. But I must say, though, it's when the football community came together. Mm -hmm. Motherwell were fantastic with us um, because you can imagine the, the amount of people who would want to go to the funeral... Um, Motherwell made made space for the refereeing team, um, so we managed to go and pay our respects as well. Um, and you know, we, we thanked Motherwell afterwards because the way they handled it was was with proper respect, That's super. Um, which was great. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned there in that story that you didn't want to speak to anybody. You only spoke to John Robotham and the, the other person you mentioned as well. Referees, they never ever speak to the press. Referee linesmen, they never have any communication with the press. Is that a, a written rule when you sign up to be a referee or? Not really, no. I mean, again, it's another myth that, you know, we, we, the reason 99% per, 99 of the time we don't want to speak to the media, in particular the written media, is that they can twist your words. Um, you know, that's why it's no comment or whatever. It's different when you're being filmed like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can edit it, but you can't change what I say. Exactly. Or if you can, you're a very good <laughs> technician, whatever. But no, I think I think the biggest problem is that, for example, the Anderlecht game. If I'm going to speak to the media, how did you get that wrong? Well, at the moment, I can't tell you. Until I look back on the video and see where my positioning was, see where the second last defender was, and see where the attackers were, you, you can't say. 
Yeah. So, I mean, if they want you to come out, and the other problem you've got as well, David, is, say, for example, there's a, a major mistake in a game, an Edinburgh derby, an Old Firm game or whatever, and you come out and say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Before you know it, as we touched on earlier on, Google's a wonderful thing. Bang. You know, the, the media hammer you. And this is what the other thing that, you, you know, that 99% of the people don't see is your family, your mechanism that helps you behind you. Um, I mean, that touch wood, I was, I was only abused once after an old firm game in my local Asda, of all places. <laughs> um, so I've been fortunate. You get the odd comment when you're watching a game in the pub and whatever, but nobody really knows assistant referees. It's the referees that are well known. Um, obviously, you know, by a name like Conquer, you're going to you're going to stand out a wee bit, um, but no, the assistants don't really, you know, don't don't get the limelight unless they made a mistake. Yeah. Um, David Room in the League Cup last year, you know, the the papers and his names plastered everywhere. The media don't realise that the damage they can do. Yeah, especially to your working life. Yeah, because there's a, there's a famous uh, story about uh, John Beaton going into a so-called Rangers pub. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a prime example of what we're just talking about here, isn't it? Put yeah. yourself in that spotlight and then the media portraying that. Yeah, and again, if you look at the pub in question and look at where it is, it's in the town where John stays. Mm. No, I'm lucky because I stay in Dunfermline, but my local pub's Elizabethan, which is, you know, the closest pub to, to East End Park. Yeah. But am I going to get the same, you know, if I made a mistake or I refereed a game involving Dunfermline or assistant referee and I made a mistake, am I going to get the same criticism because I went into the Elizabethan that's on the Holbeath Road. You know, it's... Yep. And again, is it true? I don't know. I never, I've never actually asked John if it was true or not. Yep. Um, <laughs> and again, it could have been that somebody took a photograph and photoshopped it. You just never know. And that's one of the main reasons. Yeah. Um, we would love to explain, you know, why we got decisions wrong. But why did the media never come to us and ask how we got the decision right? Because it's a two-sided coin. Um, that's a good point you know th it's true it's always a negative the glass is always half empty no my glass is always half full or three quarters full if you speak to some of the boys but <laughs> um, but no I mean and again touching on the media you could take as they do every year they take the managers and the players or the, the captain and the, and the manager they all meet up um, to go over the, the changes if there are any changes to the laws of the game if you ask any player I would say 99.9 .9 of them wouldn't be able to tell you how many laws of the game there are. In fact, let's test it. <laughs> Do you know how many laws of the game there are? No, couldn't tell you. I couldn't, I'd be making it up. I'd be guessing. Yeah, and most people do. So this is one for you. When we do get back into a pub and you're with the boys and you ask them a, a question. So what's the answer? There's 17 written, but the 18th law is common sense. Right. There are only 17 written laws, but there's obviously, within the 17 laws... You know, there's loads and loads of... Sub-directories of that. Yes, yeah. yes. And I think the Laws of the Game book's about 187 pages long, but there are only 17 written Laws of the Game. That's mental. 18th Common Sense, like you say. Common say. Sense, yeah. And do, so do you think the media are aware of these 17 and all the sub-directory laws? That no, I've spoke to a few guys behind the scenes um, in my role at the moment as assistant referee observer because mm. we we've get to we've got the privileged position of sitting in the director's box and... Um, you know, you get to go to the boardroom, or you did prior to the game. Obviously, with COVID, we're not doing that just now. But conversations with ex-players and um, some really famous ex-players, and even actually in the car park, um, the Aberdeen Celtic semi-final, I bumped into Willie Muller and Pat Bonner, right. and they were asking me about the day before the Edinburgh derby about the substitution. How was there an extra substitution allowed? And that was because they had agreed. At this last season there would be five substitutes within the 90 minutes and one extra in extra time if required and if you wanted to use them right. so obviously Wally Muller and, and, and uh, Pat Bonner um, they, I think they were doing the, the TV that day and they didn't know what the argument was because Jack Ross and Robbie Nielsen were actually arguing with the fourth official about how many subs there were yep. so the media, I don't know. <laughs> That's absolutely crazy. One thing you normally see is um, linesmen's being wiped out or tripping up or dropping their flag <laughs> or any funny stories like that ever happened to you, Willie? Uh, there's, I've actually fell on my backside live on the telly twice, <laughs> both at Ross County. 
both on call offs, so the, the game wasn't meant to be mine when the referee calls off for a reason and then you get given the game. Yeah. Um, so twice I've, I've slipped on my backside, which if you actually go into YouTube and, and Google it, you're. You Google's a wonderful it. thing. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> um, another funny one was at Livingston with Craig Charleston, um, where the centre half tried to clear the ball and it actually hit me right in the privates <laughs> and we couldn't continue because I'm standing on the line and because I'm part of the game the referees and assistants are part of the game the ball bounced and stays in the park but nobody went near the ball because they were all laughing at me because I was obviously <laughs> hitting the knackers um, and then my last game um, it was touched on um, Heart Celtic live on Sky and uh, Dimitri Mitchell and James Forrest were chasing the ball down the touchline uh, both decided to tackle at the same time and unfortunately I was at the end of it and got completely wiped out. Um, <laughs> and I've got a, a lovely memento because when I retired, um, the referee operations department within the SFA actually gave me the, the, the framed photograph of me getting taken out. So it's, up, it's sitting private in my, in my spare room. <laughs> There's a famous incident as well, we never touched on this earlier, we'll come back to it. Aberdeen against Hearts up at Petaudry, there was a disallowed goal, wasn't there? Yes, there was again on the eve. It seems to happen. It seemed to happen to me on the eve of going away in Europe. Um, <laughs> again, it was a, it was an early kick off. Aberdeen won the game one nil, um, but there was a free kick that came over from my my side of the field to play. Um, Aberdeen scored, and of course I, I flagged offside. And it wasn't until afterwards you you sort of you, you analyse the game. And what had happened was the size of the the Aberdeen backline that day were all six odd. Um, and unfortunately, I never seen we Jamie Walker at the back post who was playing them all on because obviously these Jamie's only five foot, yeah. well eight five foot nine. Um, so th- you don't want to make a mistake at any point because if that game finishes one one, then Aberdeen have lost two points. You don't know if that could affect you no know, European places, winning the league, whatever. Um, so obviously after the game, showered and changed, and I've got an hour and well just under a two hour drive back down to Dunfermline. And it plays on your mind, you know, because you know you've made a mistake. Because we'd seen the DVD after the game, so before we left there, because we were going away in Europe on the on the Monday, mm-hmm. um, we wanted to make sure that we were clear that you know why the mistake happened, and that's what it comes down to. You can be unfortunate that it, some people say to me, "Well, that can't be, you can't, you know, you can't use that as a reasoning." Well, that's the truth. Yeah. Um, but I got back in the car driving down the road. Um, obviously Willie Collum was the referee and Willie phoned me um, just to make sure I was alright um, he said look don't worry about it you know it's one of these things it could happen to anybody thankfully you know the game finished the way it did yep. it's not affected anything um, you know pick yourself back up um, ready to go on the Monday and we, we met up on the Monday at the airport and thankfully on the, the Tuesday night in the Champions League game the game went um, really well for the whole team so um, it was a good it was a good uh, Ah, if anybody's watching who thinks, you know what, I, I quite fancy giving refereeing a go or being a linesman or official or anything, would you would you recommend it to them? 100%. I wish I'd have done it 10 years uh, previous to when I did, because as I said earlier, I'm, I was 28 when I passed my refereeing badge. Yeah. Um, I retired at, at 48, um, you know, although I'm still involved, but I retired from active refereeing at 48. But if I had if, if I had a thought I could get to the career or anywhere near the career, that I had, then yeah, I would have I would have started well before I did, and even if you don't get to the the, the you know the higher um, the higher leagues, but even the kids football, you know, I watch a lot of kids football around about where I am, yep. especially watching the, the guys that um, coming through the Fife Referees Association, just to be there and watch them, give them a wee g up to a wee couple of pointers as to what to do and whatever. It's 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 great, and it's it's a it's an absolute now as a as an assistant referee. There's a great career there for the guys as well as being a referee. So if you don't make it to the top of refereeing, you could always go down the other path of assistant refereeing because yeah. that career can be just as as good. Brilliant. So you've touched on it a couple of times, your current role. What is it you're doing just now then, Molly? What is your role with the I'm the referees? classed as an assistant referee observer. Right. So I go to the games when appointed to observe the two assistants. Um, most of the games in the Premier League, you'll have a referee observer and an assistant referee observer and in the lower league games. So the referee observer goes to watch the referee and the assistant referee observer goes to watch the assistants. So before COVID, you'd listen in, you'd have the listening device so you can hear the banter with what's going on. Um, you can hear also the communication. For example, um, there was a game earlier on this season, I 
think it was Livingston Hibs, where there was a foul, was it inside, outside the box? So you could hear the assistant telling the referee whether it was inside or outside, because obviously that that's the deciding line is if it's in or out. Um, so we, we get to listen in and then take notes on offsides, fouls given, blah, blah, blah. Speak to the guys after the game and then you write a report and the, the, the reports are all, you know, graded. And then at the end of the season, the referee observers are asked to put in any recommendations of who should be promoted or um, whatever. And then you're looking, they look at the marks that they've had over the season and then they, they decide who should be put forward for promotion or who should... Who should Is that a good be. standard the referee coming through? Loads, yeah, really good. Um, the, a lot of the younger guys now, um, they're very keen. Um, they're all machines, you know. They're all, you know, like the you know in the old days, of this, you could always tell who the assistants were. Um, <laughs> but but it's uh, no, it's a good role. It's it's time consuming as well. But yeah. after the career I had, I was delighted to be offered the opportunity to do it because it means I can give that bit back because I got a lot out of the game. So to give give a bit back, then it's. Um, it's, it's fun, yeah, and it's good. We get to watch a game. At the moment, we're privileged because we're getting into the games. Yeah, when others aren't. When others aren't. I've absolutely loved this interview. Ladies and gentlemen, Willie Conquer. Thanks, David.